I should like to call your attention this morning to that portion of scripture that we read in the book of Revelation, in the third chapter, from verse 14 to the end of the chapter, which is, of course, the letter of the risen Lord to the church of the Laodiceans. I don't read any one verse again, because obviously this is a letter that contains one big message, and it is right therefore that we should look at it as a whole. It's the last of these seven letters that are recorded in these uh, two chapters, chapters 2 and 3 of the book of Revelation, letters from the risen Lord to churches on earth. Now, there is no doubt that Originally, uh, these words were addressed to particular churches in the actual condition that they were in at the time. But, as has generally been agreed uh, throughout the centuries, these letters are also addressed to the church in general, passing through different conditions and phases throughout the century. So that these letters are always of value and always of application. Between them, they do indeed include most of the conditions through which the church has passed, and they even include in their message the varying conditions in actual churches at the present time. So that here we have messages that are always of vital importance to us and for us. Now we've been trying the last two Sunday mornings and again this morning to look at the state and the condition of the Christian church at the present time. And when I say the church, I mean once more, not only the church in general, but also each one of us as a particular and individual member of the Christian church. Uh, It's obvious from the state of the world and from the state of the church herself that there is something wrong. The church is not functioning as she has done and as she should do. And therefore our business is to discover what it is exactly that is wrong with us. And we've been already considering two explanations of this state and of this condition. And here this morning we come uh, to yet another. And I take this particular letter, not because it's the last, but because it does seem to me to be the one that uh, speaks most directly to the condition of the Christian church at the present time. And as I understand it, and as I hope to show you, to the condition of the evangelical church at the present time. I think that that is the peculiar characteristic of this letter. And uh, I want to open it out before you. It's one of the saddest of the seven letters. Indeed, probably the saddest of all. Our Lord has nothing to commend in connection with this church. It is a series of criticisms. It's spoken, I think, in sadness as he looks upon the state and the condition of this church. Well, now the great question for us is this. Is this true of us, or isn't it? Is this particular message one that uh, applies to us this morning? Well, the only thing we can do is to heed our Lord's injunction at the end. He says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Have we this sensitive ear? Can we hear? Let us pray that we may have our ears circumcised, as it were, in order that we may hear truly. Now, as we come to consider the message, let us recall the one uh, who is addressing us. And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the perfect one, the complete one, the one who is in and of himself everything, but is also the faithful and true witness. There is nothing false in him. He said himself that he was the light, he is the truth. And he is truth, and he is light. And uh, nothing wrong, therefore, or nothing that is sham, or nothing that partakes of any kind of pretense is to be found in him. As we read his letter, let us remember who he is, and that he desires truth in our inward parts. Let us remember that nothing is hidden from him, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. There is no possibility of any benefit in the Christian life, no improvement, unless we are honest and open and realize that we are indeed in the presence of this one who can describe himself accurately as the Amen, 
the first and the last, the beginning, the end, the sum of all truth, and one who is a faithful and a true witness. Now thank God that he is. He tells us the truth about ourselves. Doesn't conceal anything, but just tells us exactly what the position is. But he demands the same kind of thing as we shall see of us. And he is the beginning of the creation of God, which means that everything has been handed to him, the universe, and especially the church. He is the head of all things but to the church in particular, who is the fullness of him and filleth all and in all. Well now, it's very essential that we should realize all this, that we are not dealing with something, therefore, which is but human, or dealing with a human criticism or a human analysis. This is the wonderful thing about the church, that she's in such a relationship to the Lord that he deals directly with her. She's the bride of Christ. These are some of the pictures that are used. And he deigns to deal with us and to speak with us in this direct and immediate manner. Well, now, what does he say to this church of the Laodiceans? And as I'm asking that question, I, I ask you to carry in your minds the other question. Is this, I wonder, a true description of the church today? Is it true of us? Now, what, what does he describe as the state and the condition of this church of the Laodiceans? That's the best starting point, perhaps. What was its condition? Well, he makes it perfectly clear. He says, it's lukewarm. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou wert cold or hot. Uh, so then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I am about to spew thee out of my mouth. Now, it's really important we should understand this uh, state that he describes here. What is this state of lukewarmness? Well, as he defines it, and as we are familiar with the term, we know that it means this. You, can't, you couldn't say that this church or its people were cold. They were not without interest. They were not altogether without feeling. You can't describe them as uh, being like ice or cold, iceberg. That's not true of them. There was an element of warmth there. There was something there. He says they're not cold. And, of course, this was true of them, and it is true of all who are in this Laodicean condition. And this is what makes this condition such a, a sad one and a, such a, a terrible one, and makes him speak as he does about his relationship to a church that continues in that state and condition. And remember, it's all equally applicable to any individual that is amongst us. Well, then, this is the first thing. They're, you can't say they're cold. You can't say they're lifeless. You can't say that there's nothing there. There is something there. But then, you see, the trouble is that they're not hot either. You can't describe it as real warmth. Well, it isn't cold, it isn't hot. There's just enough to say that it isn't cold, but there isn't enough to say that it's warm or that it's hot. What does this mean? Well, what it means is this, that there was no true emotion there, there was no true feeling. There was no true enthusiasm for the Lord and for his cause. Now, these people could be enthusiastic about other things, but they, there was none of that enthusiasm where the Lord was concerned or where his work or where his kingdom was concerned. They're not cold, but they're not hot. What is this condition, then, as put in more modern terms? Well, it is, uh, I would say, something like this. It is uh, to be in a kind of sentimental condition. And that is the whole trouble with sentimentality. You can't say that the sentimental person is devoid of feeling, but you can say that the sentimental person knows nothing about true emotion. That is the difference between sentimentality and emotion. At, at, on the surface, it looks as if there is emotion, there is true feeling. But the moment you begin to analyze it, and especially put it uh, up in contrast with a true emotion, you realize that it is not emotion at all. 
In other words, the condition of these people was that uh, they were rather proud of the fact that they never went to extremes. They rather liked this. And this is a mentality with which we are very familiar, are we not? This has been a very popular idea as to uh, how a man should be, uh, the natural man should be. There are those who are always contrasting themselves with people who are emotional. And they feel they always strike the happy medium. These people who are balanced. Who never go to extremes. They're always polite. They're always controlled. They're always respectable. And they think that this indeed is almost the hallmark of perfection. But you see it's a condition which our Lord reprobates. Uh, but it's very essential that we should be clear as to what he means by this definition. And I can't think of any better way of putting it than to say that it is just typical of what is called sentimentality. The sentimental person is anxious that we should realize that he's not divided of feeling. But on the other hand, he's equally anxious that we should know that he is not carried away by emotion. He's got it all, as it were, in this balanced condition which he regards as being ideal. Now, our Lord reprobates this, as I say, and he says, if you continue in this condition, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. Why does he say this? Well, the answer is, of course, that in the end, I suppose, this is the greatest insult that we can ever offer to God. There is an implicit insult in this controlled, sentimental condition which is neither hot nor cold. For you see, it means this, that we are in control of the situation and that we have decided that uh, even in our relationship uh, to God, we are still in charge. I've often heard people uh, putting this unconsciously in words. They say it's very right, of course, to be religious, but... Uh, you mustn't take it too seriously. You mustn't become an extremist, they say. It's all right, and we believe in doing this, but, you know, there's a limit after all. I remember a man once uh, misquoting that statement of Paul in Philippians 4, let all your things be with moderation. And he was applying that uh, to the Christian life. And uh, the idea that these people have is this, that even in their very relationship to God, they're still always in control. They know nothing about being lost in wonder, love, and prayer. Now, they can get very excited about other things. They can be very moved by other things. They can be moved to tears by a play or by a drama. They can get excited and thrilled by football matches and other forms of sport. But they're never like that in connection with their religion. And they would almost feel ashamed if they ever did experience something like that. Their great phrase is, let everything be done decently and in order. Now, that's scriptural. But it doesn't refer to this. The fact that we do not believe in excesses does not mean that we are advocating lukewarmness. But this is the very great danger that so constantly uh, afflicts a certain type of individual, a certain type of Christian person. In our horror and dread of excesses, we get into this state described here of the Laodiceans. And so we are neither hot nor cold. You can't say that we are devoid of feeling, and yet there is no true emotion. There is none of this idea of being moved to the depth of our being, and as I say, being lost in wonder, love, and praise. In other words, it is respectability, sentimentality, a kind of mild feeling that does duty for true warmth, true richness, and true emotion. That's the statement which our Lord makes about the church of the Laodiceans. That has been the condition of the Christian church many a time since. Is it not the state and the condition of the Christian church today? And I say, especially perhaps those of us who are evangelical, that this will become still more clear when I come to the second thing he says about them, which is that they were complacent and that they are self-satisfied. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and of need of nothing. That's what they said about themselves. And they believed that this was true. Now this generally accompanies 
this lukewarm condition. It's a part of it. It's a further expression of that. You see, the moment you are in charge of your Christianity, this follows. This is the fatal thing, that, it, that we are in charge of it instead of it being in charge of us. That's the very essence of our Lord's diagnosis of this church. Even their relationship to God and the Lord Jesus Christ was in their hand. And the result was they were very pleased with themselves. They were very satisfied. They were not conscious of any lack. They were not conscious of any need. They felt that they'd got everything in the realm of mind and understanding, in the realm of art, and in the realm of their wills, their conduct, their practice, and their behavior. What am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about this kind of person. There are some people who are completely satisfied because they're orthodox. You see, they can say that they're not curled. They're not like the liberal, the modernist, the man who denies the faith, and they're always denouncing them. There they are, they say, how terrible. They contrast themselves with that. And they, they've got the truth. They're orthodox. They believe the right thing. So they're very pleased with themselves. And there they are always guarding this and dotting the I's and crossing the T's. So they're not cold like those unbelievers. They know the truth and they've got it and they understand it and they possess it. And they're very pleased with themselves as guardians and custodians of the faith. But then, you see, on the other hand, they're very pleased with themselves because they're not wild also. They say, look at those wild people, those enthusiasts. Look at those people who are always getting so excited. They're not like that. No, no, they're always controlled. Now, all this, as you realize, is extremely difficult to put into words because all along one sounds as if one is advocating a wildness. But I'm not. All I'm saying is that these people fall into error because in their pride in themselves, because they're not wild, they're not hot. They're not cold, but they're not hot either. And not to be cold and not to be hot is thoroughly bad. But I'm trying to describe this condition of self-satisfaction and of uh, complacency, which uh, feels, therefore, that in general it is in this right position. It's orthodox. It's controlled, it's decent, it's respectable. It has a kind of sentimental feeling, but there's never any loss of oneself in this grand inertion. No, no, we don't like that sort of thing. Everything must be done decently and in order. Let me perhaps tell you a story which will illustrate what I'm saying perfectly. It's the story that you'll find in the biography of that great missionary, Dr. Jonathan Goforth, who was used of God in revival in Korea and in Manchuria in the early part of this present century, 1904, 5 and 6. And he was coming home, going home to Canada on furlough and had to pass through this country. And uh, certain authorities uh, who hold um, great meetings every year in this country heard that he was coming through this country and wondered what they should do with him. They were in trouble for this reason. They had read the reports of the revivals in Manchuria and Korea, and they had read that sometimes the meetings there would go on all night. Having started in the evening, they'd go on all night, and that sometimes there was a, a little display of excess, that people were carried away, and the physical frame seemed almost incapable of receiving this great benefit from the Spirit. There was sometimes a, a kind of disorder in the meeting, what someone once described as an orderly disorderliness. The kind of thing you get in revival. Now, these people were very troubled about this. What could they do? So they decided to ask this man to speak, but they reminded him that he must remember that he was no longer in Korea, no longer in Manchuria, that in their meetings, well, they'd got a timetable and a program, and everything was done decently and in order. Now, that's the kind of condition that I'm describing. Not cold, but certainly not hot, having an abhorrence of true emotion, even as they have an abhorrence of looseness and laxity in doctrine on the other hand. And at the same time, of course, they're moral and they're decent. They don't do the things that other people do. They've got their curve, they've got their set ideas about how to live, and they never deviate from it at all. Why then? They bring up their family, 
They teach them uh, the Bible, take their children to Sunday school. They've done all these things. There's nothing in a sense that they're not doing. Not only that, they're busy, they're active, they're workers. They're prepared to do anything they can to help, and they take great interest in these matters. But there they are. They're self-contained. They're self-satisfied. They say, um, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Now, the question we ask ourselves is this. Are you conscious of any need this morning? Are you conscious of any dissatisfaction? Or do you really think you're doing remarkably well? Indeed, that well, there's nothing more to be desired. What more could one desire? One believes the right things, one attends a place of worship, one's concerned about speaking to others, everything's going well, I have need of nothing. This is the question. These people really believed that that was true. They were perfectly satisfied. And they said, quite honestly, I really don't need any more. Now, here is the most important question we can ever face. Do we feel like that? What's your real feeling about yourself as a Christian? Have you got it all? And how do you view the future? Do you feel that if you can just go on as you are now, that all will be well, nothing more is desired? Is that your feeling? If so, you're a Laodicean. So you analyze yourself in terms of your intellect and understanding of truth and in your feeling and in the realm of your conduct and of your practice. Now, you see, what our Lord says to such people is this. If you continue like this, I am about to spill thee out of my mouth. It's one of the most terrible things he ever said. This, I say, is something that he reprobates more than anything else. Why? Well, I repeat, it is because it is the greatest possible insult to God. He says, I would that you were either cold or hot. You know, there's more hope for a man who's right outside than for this kind of person. He makes no pretense. He doesn't claim to have anything, either in belief or conduct or practice or behavior or anything else. This is worse than to be cold. Indeed, the history of the church throughout the centuries, I think, demonstrates this quite clearly. The people who have generally been the most bitter opponents of reformation and revival have been this kind of Christian believer in the Christian church. Now, they are Christians, remember. They are Christians. You can't say they're cold. They do believe. They're in the church. But these are the people who have always hindered revival, true reawakening. Why? Well, because they're so pleased. They say, what are you talking about revival? There are people who are saying this today. They say, you, some of you are always talking about revival. What are you talking about revival for? Look at the campaigns. Look at the Bible colleges. All full. What more do you need? Everything seems to be perfect. And this is true of groups of people. It is true of individual Christian people. They really can't see that there's anything wrong at the present time. They feel things are going remarkably well. And they have need of nothing. All we need to do is to keep on, they say, as we are. Lukewarm. Neither cold nor hot. Very well, what's the cause of this condition? Our Lord makes it quite clear. It can be put in one word. It is ignorance. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor, blind and naked. Now, my dear friends, I do hope we've got this picture clearly in our minds. He doesn't say that this church was guilty of wrong belief. He doesn't say that this church was guilty of immorality. Other churches were, and he's had to deal with that. He doesn't say that. Looked at, you see, superficially and externally, there's no criticism of this church. What was really wrong with this church was its whole spirit, its whole attitude towards the Lord and towards itself. This is the appalling and the terrible thing. You see, when people are respectable, you can't uh, criticize them for being guilty of particular sins because they're not guilty of them. The trouble with them is it's the sheer smallness of the thing, the sheer lifelessness, this absence of heat, this is the terrifying thing about this. So we've got to analyze it and see what he means. You don't know, he says. You're ignorant. You're ignorant. 
And this, I maintain, is always the trouble with people who are in this condition. What were, the, what, were the, what, were the, what were these Laodiceans ignorant of? Well, he tells them quite plainly they're ignorant of themselves and of their own state. Congratulating themselves, saying, I am full, I am rich, increased with goods, have need of nothing. How could she possibly have said that about herself? Well, the answer is, you see, that she'd not been examining herself. That's why he exhorts this church and these people uh, to be zealous, therefore, and repent. The difficulty with these people was that they didn't stop to think and they didn't stop to examine themselves. They assumed that everything was all right. It's what we're often told about the children of Israel under the Old Testament. There's a terrifying word with respect to them in the book of the prophet Hosea. Israel has gray hairs upon him and he knoweth it not. That's the, that's the terrible danger. It's so simple. You can understand this, can't you? Now, this was a Christian church. This consisted of people who were Christian. They believed the truth. They had accepted the message. They had joined the church. They had left the world. They were no longer guilty of certain things. And here they are in this fellowship. But now they've so arranged it that it's entirely in their control. You don't go too far one way or the other. You just keep it as you want it. It's very nice. It's Well, when you think of death, you say, oh, yes, I'm a Christian. And the blood of Christ has covered my sins. Uh, any question that arises, you've always got the appropriate answer. And uh, you say, well, of course, uh, at a time like this, the fact that I'm a Christian at all is a very wonderful thing. So many are not. So you spend a lot of your time in looking at those who are cold, those who are right outside, and you always say, well, I'm not cold. But then you don't uh, go much further. You tend to stop at that. You see certain people who seem to have lost their heads. You say, well, thank God I'm not like that. And here you are. You see, you, you're, whichever way you look, you're all right. That's because you are never looking very deeply. You just examine the position on the surface and contrast yourselves with others who are obviously wrong in some shape or form. Indeed, you see, the picture here is the picture that our Lord gives at the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, again, one of these terrifying things ought to be terrifying to every preacher and to everybody else. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. It's all true. They were quite genuine. They were perfectly sincere. There's no lie there. But he... Then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You see, this terrible possibility of self-deception. You get into a certain mold, you get into a certain groove, if you like, and you feel, well, we've arrived, this is it. What more can there be necessary? Uh, as I say, we're not in the world, we've left all that, we're not guilty of these terrible things that are happening in the world round and about us, these horrifying things that we read of in the press and we read of and see and hear on the television and the radio. We are, not all, we are all right, we are, we, are, we are free from all these things. We are respectable, we are decent, we are good, we are moral, we believe. What more? Now then, I say the trouble with these people was due to ignorance, and the ignorance arises from the fact that they haven't examined themselves as they should have done. There is a kind of examination, but as it's always negative and always contrasting themselves with extremes, they've never really faced themselves. So I put it like this. What are they ignorant of? Well, they're ignorant of their own condition because ultimately they are ignorant of the riches and the possibilities of grace. Now here is the whole trouble. You see, it's possible for us to be orthodox, possible for us to be very moral and decent and ethical, possible for us to be very busy in the work of the church, organizing, singing, going to conference after conference, and it seems marvelous, isn't it wonderful, they say. Look at the crowds, everything, it's perfection. What's the matter with these people? Well, what's really the matter with them is that they're ignorant of the riches and the possibilities of the grace of God. What does that mean? Well, it means in the first place that they've never seen it in the New Testament itself. 
You see, it is possible to read the scriptures and yet not consider them. It is possible for us all to be reading these great descriptions of the Christian and of the Christian church as you have them in the New Testament and never really to face it. Take the things that we are told here about the church, what the church really is, what the church should be. Look at the descriptions of the early church as you have it in the New Testament. I have called your attention a great deal to these things during the last year or so. You remember that lyrical description at the end of Acts 2. Here it is. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. We've already been told of them that they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. But it's a lyrical picture. The church was thrilled with joy. There was this vitality, this life, this abandon. You read of them later with the whole place being shaken, the very room in which they met. And here you get these marvelous descriptions. Then you get these analyses of the state and the condition of the church as she should be in the various epistles. And all these great promises of God, the church as the bride of Christ, the church as the household of God, the church as a great state, a great kingdom in which he reigns, and all these thrilling things which exhaust the very superlatives of the great apostles, all this is here before us. But somehow or another, we just glide over these statements, as if to say, well, yes, that's all right, that's very beautiful, that's very wonderful, as if they've got nothing to say to us. We don't stop and say, but am I like that? Is the church like that now? Is this a true description of the church as I know her at the present time? Is this a description of me as a Christian at this present time? There is this teaching. Not only that, we get the experiences of different persons described to us in this New Testament. Take the things that the Apostle Paul says about himself so often. Take what John says. He writes these things to us that our joy might be full, that we may have fellowship with them, and that our joy might be full, that we might be rejoicing with great assurance, and knowing these things, having lost the fear of death in the grave, seeing beyond it all, that's the picture. Now, we've, we've got this in the language we can understand, and we're all, we're, of course, we read our daily portion, don't we? We're following a scheme, and we read the notes. We've got it all. I've done my portion. I've got it. I understand. I can answer questions. My dear friend, what I'm asking is this. Have you ever examined yourself in the light of these descriptions? Here's the question. The great danger is to be content with a kind of head knowledge. We even may have passed examinations on our scriptural knowledge. And be dead and lifeless. Know nothing about this very thing about which we can answer questions so correctly. We never stop to say, now, is this true of me? Is this true of the Christian church as I know her? That was the cause of the failure of these people. It wasn't that they hadn't heard. They'd got the message and they'd believed it and they'd accepted it, but they'd never applied it. They'd never tested themselves by it. They'd never looked at themselves in the light of its teaching. Thou knowest not. And there's only one way whereby we can know, and that is to take the truth as it is given us. But then, fortunately, we can even add to that. But it makes our failure still more glaring. It makes our ignorance still more inexcusable. Not only do we fail to learn from the scriptures, we have also failed to learn from the history of the church. Because we've got it. And as I'm never tired of saying, next to the scriptures, there is nothing more profitable than to be reading the history of the Christian church. But you see, the modern man doesn't like doing that. He hasn't got time to read, he tells me. Our forefathers have time to read and to read big books. We can't. We say, we haven't got the time. We want everything in snippets. We want a little tabloid report. And we're interested in reports and we're interested in experiences, something that interests and excites us. But my dear friend, go back and look at the great history of the church. Now look at it as I say, in general. I've mentioned the question of revivals. I mentioned this question once more. Read the accounts of the church with the Spirit of God coming down upon her. And the church being lifted up and transformed and transfigured. Filled with power and with glory. Filled with singing and rejoicing and a great abandon. 
none of your polite, respectable, controlled, organized meetings, but everything bursting over the, the very edges, as it were, bursting the banks, and the whole countryside being flooded, and mighty things happening under the power of the Spirit of God. Do we know about things like this? Have we taken the trouble to examine the history of the church? Not only what we have in the Bible, but what has happened since. You see, the danger is always to sort of idealize the New Testament and say, that was all right then, but of course, the apostles were alive then, and ever since the time the apostles have gone, everything has changed. As if we are to live on a lower level, it's an absolute lie. There is no word to that effect in the whole of the New Testament. What we read here is applicable to all of us now. It's meant to be true at all times. These letters are contemporary letters. What our Lord said to the church of the Laodiceans in the first century is saying to the church today. And what proves that is, these great upheavals, as it were, these great movements, tides of the spirit, which you can read of in the long story of the Christian church. But we seem to be ignorant of all that. As if evangelicalism had only started with Finney or Moody, or somebody still more recent perhaps. My dear friends, it is our ignorance that accounts for our state and condition. Is the Christian church today as you find the church described in the New Testament? Is she as she has been in periods of revival? That's the question. And what about us as individuals? Or take it again in the history of individuals. I commend to you once more the reading of biographies and of autobiographies. Have you ever done that? And what have you done when you finished? When you read the journals of Whitfield or Wesley or somebody like that? What have you done as you've read it? Have you just said, this is marvelous, this is wonderful? As if you were reading a fairy tale and you put down the book. Or have you said to yourself, well, am I like this? And if I'm not, why am I not like this? This is meant to be true of me. These were men of like passions with myself. They were exceptional in certain respects, so am I. But am I like this? Now, it is the failure to do that that accounts for this Laodicean condition. This is the question I'm asking. As you've read of such men, have you felt at times that perhaps you're not even a Christian at all? If it doesn't have that effect upon you, you haven't read it truly. Uh, can you read the New Testament without being disturbed? If you can, there's something seriously wrong with you. If the New Testament doesn't condemn you every time you read it and make you feel, well, why am I not like this? Well, then there's something wrong with your reading. It's not examining you. It's not searching you. You haven't got ears to hear. He that has uh, any ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the judges. The Spirit is speaking. The Word is speaking. But we don't seem to hear. Now, that's the whole essence of the trouble. Because, you see, what you find here and what you find exemplified so constantly in the long history of the church is something like this. What are we meant to enjoy? Well, we are meant to enjoy the unsearchable riches of Christ. That's what we are meant to enjoy. The unsearchable riches of Christ. Are you enjoying them? That's what you... Have as a believer, you've entered into this, and there they are for you, the exceeding riches of his grace. The love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, breadth, length, depth, height, there it is, in all its eternity of wonder. Are you enjoying this? Have you entered into the possession of this? This is what we are offered in the New Testament. Come, let me be more particular. The Christian is a man who is meant to know the Lord Jesus Christ. That I might know him. These things write I unto you, says John, in the first epistle. He's writing to those who already believe. As I've reminded you, he writes that their joy might be full. This then is the message that we have heard of him, and so on. These things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. He says, that which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. 
Well, we are meant to enter into that fellowship, or as our Lord puts it here. Here it is. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. Well, he means that. That's what we are meant to be enjoying. What does this mean? Well, this is a term in which he describes the intimacy of fellowship that should be possible. It isn't merely that we believe the truth about him. Of course we do. But he offers more. He says, I will come in and I will sup with him and he with me. This is a very wonderful and glorious description of an intimate personal fellowship. You see, he's saying, you are very busy, you are doing many things, but what I'm asking you is this, are you enjoying fellowship with me? It's an intimate meeting together. There's the table. He is one side and you are the other. And he wants to talk to you. He wants to tell you about his love to you. He wants to know if you love him. That's the picture. A tete-a-tete, you're meeting together. In this intimate fellowship, you and he and he and you. And you're enjoying his fellowship. And you're enjoying him. Now, you're not merely enjoying things about him. Uh, You're not merely when you happen to think about it or when you're taken ill or are facing death. Oh yes, my sins are forgiven. Uh, When you're stopped with your busy round of activities. No, no. This is the biggest thing in your life. This is the thing that you value and prize above everything else. I am my Lord and he is mine. I know him whom I have believed. These are the things, my dear friend. Forget the people who are cold. But these, you see, are the experiences of those who know something about warmth and about love. You are familiar with these terms as we find them constantly in the New Testament. He will speak to you. And he will tell you of his love to you. He will give you intimations of this. I've so often reminded you of these things. I've read extracts out of people's diaries. How the love of Christ came upon them in wave after wave so that they could scarcely stand it. Ravishing their hearts. Carrying them away in transports of delight. Some of them testifying to being almost unconscious for hours in the enjoyment of this. Forgetting the world and everything else. Now here is the way to test ourselves. What do we know about that kind of thing? Do we know anything about his consolation? Are you able to sing the hymns truly and in an experimental manner? I need thee every hour, stay thou near by. Temptations lose their power when thou art nigh. Is that true? Now these, you see, are the ways in which we should examine ourselves. The people at Laodicea hadn't been doing this. They they didn't need to all was well. And they don't realize how poor they are. Yes, it's right to be orthodox, it's right to be moral and decent and better than the people who are in the world. But my dear friend, that's not the test for us. The test for us is this. These experiences that were given to these ordinary people in the first century that have been repeated to the saints throughout the centuries. What do we know of these? You look at the poor beggar in the street and you think you're rich. But then you look at a millionaire and you feel you're a pauper. That's the thing to do. Are you enjoying his peace? He said before he left, my peace I give unto you. My peace, peace I give unto you. My peace give I unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Are you enjoying that peace of his? That's what you're meant to enjoy. The peace of God that passeth all understanding. Now, it doesn't matter what your circumstances are. That's the teaching everywhere. Paul in prison knows the peace of God that passeth all understanding. All things are going against him all round. Doesn't matter. He's enjoying a peace that is absolutely perfect. Nothing can shake it. Nothing can disturb it. Nothing can make him lose it. Not as the world, but as I give unto you. My dear friend, are you enjoying the peace of God? God that passeth all understanding. Whatever may be happening to you, whatever you may see coming in the future, are you enjo- you're meant to enjoy it? You think you're rich, you think you've arrived, you think you've got all things, but have you got this? 
People like ourselves have enjoyed this in this world. This is very practical. This is true to life. This is not some ideal description. This is the very thing that was literally enjoyed by the early Christians. It has been enjoyed by the most ordinary people in Christ ever since throughout the running centuries. And then this joy and rejoicing. My joy gave I unto you. I read the description of the early church in Acts 2. Gladness of heart, praising God, rejoicing. Is there any praise in your life? How much? When you get on your knees, how much praise of God is there? Is it only petitions? Well, I know you've got your prayer list, haven't you? You're praying for certain people, but are you praising him? Are you expressing your love to him? Is your heart moved? Are you carried away by all this? This is the test. Isn't it terrible that we can be so mechanical and pride ourselves on it? I do pray every day. I read a portion of scripture and I pray. I look at this time to it. This is marvelous. And look at the work I'm doing. And you're, you're rich. You need nothing. But oh, is your heart moved? Is your heart drawn out? Are you carried away by love to him? Oh, let me give you it in the words of Peter again. This is what Peter says about ordinary Christians. Whom having not seen, ye love. In whom though now ye see him not yet believing, you rejoice with a joy unspeakable and full of glory to ordinary Christians. Do you still feel you're rich? Do you still feel that you need nothing? Do you still feel that you've got everything? Are you pleased with yourself? Are you proud of yourself? Oh, if you are, it just means that you're about as ignorant as a Christian can possibly be. You don't even know how to read your scriptures. You know, we are not called just to read a certain number of verses every day. We are called upon to understand what we read and appropriate it and allow it to search us and examine us and then give us of the riches, the unsearchable riches of Christ. That's the object of it all. And this is what is possible to us. And then he offers us power, he offers us ability, he offers us something of his own zeal and of his own power. Let me sum it up by putting it like this. Can we honestly say with Charles Wesley at this moment, and is this your experience? Thou, O Christ, art all I want, more than all in thee I find. Is that true? Or as another put it, sight, healing, riches of the mind, yea, all I need in thee to find. O Lamb of God, I come. Or can you say with another, object of my first desire, Jesus, crucified for me. Test yourself in the light of it. All to happiness aspire, only to be found in thee. Thee to please and thee to know, constitute my bliss below. Thee to see and thee to love, constitute my life above, my bliss above. Then he goes on, Lord, it is not life to live. If thy presence thou deny, Lord, if thou thy presence give, tis no longer death to die. Source and giver of repose, only from thy smile it flows. Peace and happiness are thine, mine they are if thou art mine. Whilst I feel thy love to me, every object teems with joy. Have you ever felt his love to you? That's the question. Love is to be felt. Love's not something abstract. Love's not something theoretical. Love is between persons. Whilst I feel thy love to me, every object teems with joy. May I ever walk with thee, for tis bliss without a lie. Let me but thyself possess, total son of happiness, real bliss I then shall prove. Heaven below and heaven above. My friend, is that true of you? That's the question. Forget everything else. And just examine yourself in the light of that possibility. That's what you're meant to have and to enjoy as a Christian. Have you got it? Are you rich or are you miserable and poor and blind and naked? Is there any cure for us if we're like the Laodiceans? Well, it's all here. I needn't stay with us. It's so plain. It's simple. It's explicit. Do you know there's only one hope for us? And that is his concern for us. If you're in this Laodicean condition, don't try to work up a feeling. Many are trying to do that. 
They'll work it up with music. They'll even jazz the music to do it. They'll clap their hands. They'll introduce false fire. Tragic. That's not it. We can't do it. It is he alone who can do it. And he is ready to do it. He says so. Even to these lower descendants, he shows his concern for us. This is what he says. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Have you been rebuked this morning? If you have, thank God. It means you're a Christian. Have you felt chastened? Have you felt humbled in this service? If you have, I tell you, you're a Christian. But if you felt nothing, you're not. If you're annoyed, you're not. This is the whole question. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. He does it for our good. And he does it in many ways. I had a letter last week from a man in a given part of this country wanting my advice and wanting to come to see me. And this is what the poor man said. I understand it so well. He says, I've been most active and busy in Christian work for 20 years. He now has to have an operation and he suddenly finds he can't pray as he'd like to. After 20 years of exceptionally busy Christian work, he finds it rather difficult to pray. What I said to that man was, that it is his loving Lord who had sent him this illness calling for an operation to save him from something worse. To make him see that in all his busyness and activity he had forgotten the most important and vital thing of all, his relationship to his blessed Lord. He chastises because he loves and he rebukes and chastens. Not only that, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. I wonder whether he's been knocking at the door of your life this morning, even as I've been speaking feebly. He uses even this kind of thing. He's got other ways of doing it. He stands at the door, he knocks, he even whispers, he speaks. Do you hear his voice? What a wonderful thing that he should do that for us who've been so self-satisfied and pleased that we've even forgotten him. And not only does he stand at the door and knock, he's got everything we need. He's got this gold tried in the fire. He's got the perfect clothing. He's got the eye salve. What's the gold? I believe it's faith that opens to us the riches of his grace, the clothing, the garment of praise, the eye salve. Oh, it's spiritual understanding. And that's the thing that's so lacking today. Spiritual understanding. People are so pleased with activities that they have the spiritual understanding to see their poverty or even to grasp the riches of his grace. Eye salve. Never have we needed it more than at this present time that our eyes may see the possibilities of the grace of God, all that is treasured to us in the Son of his love. And all you and I need to do is to listen to him. Give yourself a chance to hear him. Silence the raucous voices of the world for a while and even the shouting in the church. Be still. Listen. Listen to him in the silences. Be still and know that I am God. And you'll hear the knock. You'll hear the whisper of his voice. And all you've got to do is to open the door. See, this is a text for Christians. It should never be used evangelistically. This is a text for Christians only. We've got the power to open the door. And we have got to open the door. And he will come in. Have you felt chastised and rebuked? Have you repented of your foolish pride? Your foolish self-satisfaction? Have you seen your nakedness, your emptiness, your utter poverty? Open the door. And he'll come in. And in a moment he'll give you to feel something that you've never felt in the whole of your life. Your heart will be warm. It will begin to burn. And you'll go on your way rejoicing and will be a blessing to others in a way that you can scarcely imagine. God, have mercy upon us. Oh, that we may give him time, that we may silence everything and listen to the voice divine. Though in rebuke, it is full of love.
and he has to give us all the unsearchable riches of the grace of God. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.